Today we're going to talk about it, something which is so critical to both women and men. And surprisingly, I thought it was only a problem with women, but it's actually not. Osteoporosis. What is it? Who gets it? What causes it? How do you diagnose it and how do you treat it? Osteoporosis, as the term says, is basically porous bone, meaning that the bone is brittle and has a risk of fracturing. It's most often seen as a chronic disease in your 70s and 80s in more women than in men. And one in three women by the age of 50 will have some degree of osteoporosis globally. And one in five men will have osteoporosis globally. Now the interesting part is, when I was researching this, I never thought men were at risk, but they actually are. What can this lead to? Well, it can lead to an increased risk of fractures in your long bones, in the femurs, in your hips, and in your back. And as a result of that, has a significant amount of morbidity and mortality, meaning that there's a threefold higher risk if you fracture your hip in your 70s and 80s of dying versus someone who's an age-matched, sex-matched counterpart. So it's not a small problem and it's not something we should take for granted. But how does it develop? Well, the interesting thing about bones is that they're a dynamic organ. And I call them an organ because everyone thinks about them as a separate scaffold or a skeleton, but in fact, they are alive and, and breathing, if you will, and dynamically reorienting to the stresses you put on them. What are the factors that can affect them? Well, interestingly enough, the peak bone density in women is at the age of 30. And the interesting part is women are at higher risk for osteoporosis for a number of reasons. The first is they have smaller bones. And if you think of the bone as a bank for calcium, then the idea is essentially that they are putting in their calcium bank early in life up to about 30. But what are the things that take deposits out of that bank? The first is that they have pregnancies. And when they're pregnant, the baby is a calcium hound in that they're taking calcium directly to build their bones. And that happens during the pregnancy as well as afterwards when they're breastfeeding. Compounded to that, if the women don't get enough calcium, enough vitamin D3, and enough nutrients in their bodies, we end up having a negative balance. And that is reflected in the bones of the mother, not in the baby. The second thing is, that if all things were equal, oftentimes people have vitamin D3 deficiencies. And also in India in particular, we may have low calcium diets and or low protein diets. The combination of these will lead to lower bone density. But then in addition to that, there may be sex disparity where men are fed more than women and women often put themselves last and don't always take care of themselves. And so that may also lead to more osteoporosis. And then lastly, in women, once they hit menopause, the delicate milieu and, and jugglebundy between estrogen and progesterone are shut down. Estrogen basically turns off. And as a result, the bone density doesn't change as much. So whatever you go into menopause with is what you will end up with if you're not careful. Now you ask me, what are the other things that can be there? And we talk about primary osteoporosis and secondary. Primary is from the hormonal causes, from uh, other reasons, and then secondary is from underlying hormonal issues like hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, kidney problems where your calcium is not modulated, and then also some of your other hormones aren't taken care of, um, which build some of the bone stock. What are the signs and symptoms of osteoporosis? Well, that's the hard part. Most people will not know they have it until they have a fracture unless you're looking for it. How do you diagnose osteoporosis and who's at risk? Well, if you have a first degree relative or you have a history of fractures, there's a risk you may have osteoporosis. If you're a woman who's postmenopausal, the risk is there. Or if you've had poor nutrition and there's other signs of that, then you're at risk. But how do you quantify that? Secondly, there's something called a FRAC score, which can predict in a 10-year period who is at risk for fractures. And it looks at your age, bone densometry, your sex, male versus female, 
uh, your nutrition and other factors, and it gives you an idea. And remember, as you get older, your risk of falls is higher. That compounded with this osteoporosis puts you at high risk for mortality, as we've talked about, a threefold higher mortality rate. Now, in some of these things, we can't modify the risk factors, and these are often genetic. If you have a history of fracture in yourself or in a first degree relative, your risk is much higher. Additionally, if you're Caucasian, the risk is actually higher. The lowest is in Afro-Americans, and Asians are somewhere in the middle at 11 to 15 percent. In addition, if you have advanced age, dementia, or frailty, and there's scores for all of these things, your risk is higher. And finally, if you're a female, your risks are higher. And these are non-modifiable risk factors. At the same time, there's some modifiable risk factors, and this is very important. Number one, if you're a current cigarette smoker, your risk of osteoporosis goes up dramatically, and it has to do with the absorption of calcium as well as the osteoblasts and osteoclasts and various other things. So just quitting smoking alone, while it helps you with many, many things, actually is an independent risk factor for osteoporosis. Secondly, if you have an early menopause and you're less than 45, or you have bilateral oophorectomies, meaning both your um, ovaries have been removed, or you have prolonged premenopausal amenorrhea, meaning you don't menstruate though you're premenopausal, the risk of osteoporosis is higher, and that's actually a modifiable risk because it's something you can change. A low BMI, someone who's got a low body mass index, you actually have a higher risk of osteoporosis, and it's thought to be secondary to nutritional reasons. And then obviously, low dietary calcium intake. Now we've talked a little bit about this in the Indian diets, but in general, how many of these people are taking calcium or drinking milk or doing other things? Nowadays, more and more people have lactose intolerance and they're not supplementing, and so that is an issue. Alcoholism is associated with a higher risk of osteoporosis. Recurrent falls are associated with osteoporosis because every time you fall, the bone has to remodel and it's chewing up calcium to rebuild that. Finally, inadequate physical activity is a modifiable cause of osteoporosis because it doesn't load the, the uh, bone column. All right, now we know you're at risk for osteoporosis. How do you work this up? What are the tests that I would do and what are the things to do? First, see a doctor and make sure that your situation is discussed in depth about all your risk factors for it and that you're concerned about it. The simplest thing is to get your labs done first. Once that's done, if there's, we find problems, then we can go down those pathways. Next, doing just a simple x-ray will give you some idea of if your bone is osteopenic. And that can actually be a strong predictor, uh, if you have low bone density on the x-ray, of osteopenia or osteoporosis. Then beyond that, they can do some other studies which look at specifics within that. What are the treatments for this? Well, the obvious ones for the modifiable risks are smoke cessation. That one I would say do anyways for your lungs, your heart, your vascular system. But now, obviously for osteoporosis. The second thing that you can do is what we've talked about it in exercise at any age. In addition to helping your heart, doing routine exercise three to four times a week with 30 minutes minimum with a combination of aerobics, strength training, running, and other things which will actually load your columns. Interestingly enough, swimming doesn't do it as well because you basically take the gravity out of the equation. And if you look at swimmer's bones versus runner's bones, the runner's bones will be more dense. Next, one of the mainstays is calcium supplementation and vitamin D3. I've talked about it on a different episode, but vitamin D3 insufficiency is epidemic. Now one would think we live in the tropics, plenty of sun, right? And even if you didn't drink milk, you would still get vitamin D3. But the truth is Indians live like vampires. They only come out in the morning and the evening. And as a result of that, we often want to be fairer and we don't want to get dark. But the truth is we may not be getting adequate sunlight for conversion of vitamin D on our skins. Therefore, we need to be cognizant of that and Know, take vitamin D supplementation in our foods, and in the worst case, in satchels or other things under a doctor's guidance. Secondly, calcium is often there as a supplement in many of your foods, but if you're not drinking dairy, as in my case, I'm vegan, I have to make sure that I supplement my calcium 
and I supplement my vitamin D as well as vitamin B and a few other things. And we've talked about that in a different episode. The good news is the prognosis is actually significantly better if we can identify patients who are at risk for this. Um, the first step is build up your calcium bank and your bone bank prior to menopause in women. And even in healthy adults, you should be stocking up on calcium and other things. The second is that in particular, if you're pregnant or you have any problems with absorption, make sure that we check to see that your calcium is adequate. Um, third, vitamin D3. What can I say? There's so many studies now which talk about it, and for various reasons, we should be addressing it. But this is just another one. The hope would be that by doing this, we avoid having those critical fractures, which we've talked about, uh, increase mortality significantly. And you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This is one of those cases where if you just knew about it sooner and took care of it, we could prevent it from ever happening. I hope this has helped. I've left the links in the description. I appreciate you listening in. And as always, if you like what we said, hit the like button. If you want to see more like this, hit the subscribe button. And if you don't mind, share this with all your friends in building the channel, certainly, but more importantly, spreading the news so that we can prevent, early recognize, and early treat something which is really treatable and if not treated, can lead to significant harm. I appreciate you joining me and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode.